Good evening and welcome everyone to the Alex Samo I Am A PT podcast. And we are thrilled to have tonight joining us, Dr. Adam Javili, uh, founder of Pelvic NYC and also fitness um, instructor and works with a few of the Peloton instructors, a couple of my favorite ones as well. So welcome Adam to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, man. Looking forward to tonight. Again, thank you very much for, for joining us uh, tonight uh, out of your busy schedule. Uh, obviously, as being a father like myself, you know that uh, those privileges keep us pretty busy. Uh, so really appreciate you taking the time out. Um, as always, thank you to all of our followers. Uh, all our supporters, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, make sure you subscribe, like on YouTube channel, uh, our, all of our social media accounts. You can see it on the bottom, scrolling through. But uh, thank you very much and and for joining us and, and supporting us uh, in this journey. And and tonight's episode should be a pretty cool, uh, fun one, and and a lot of good topics should come. Uh, as Mo mentioned. Dr. Uh, J- Am I saying that right? Javili? Gavili. Say it again, Gavili. 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 Okay. Uh, Dr. Gavili, who uh, founded Pelvis NYC. And as some of you have noticed on this month, we've had a lot of, uh, we had Dr. Cindy Duke uh, last week, who is uh, OBGYN slash fertility uh, based out of Las Vegas. And then the week before that, uh, we had Dr. Merriman, was that? that? Alexandra Hill. Alexandra Hill, Alex. sorry. Uh, Pelvic. A pelvic PT as well. So this month's topic, we just kind of decided to kind of go the pelvic route. So, you know, Adam fits in just nice. And, and I think it's a it's a good, good change because most of the time you think of pelvic uh, PT and probably thinking a female therapist uh, with primarily female uh, clientele. And, you know, Adam can tell us a little bit about his practice and and what that kind of typically deals with. So again, thanks Adam for joining us. So tell us about how you got started. Like, where did you go to PT school? What was that journey like? Sure, so I went to uh, Mercy College in Dobbs Ferry. Um, it's in kind of Westchester, New York. Uh, it was a weekend program, so it was three and a half years. It allowed me to work, so I got to support me and my wife at the time, um, and allowed me the flexibility to go to school actually and, and enjoy life. You know, not take out too many loans, of course, right? Um, had a great cohort there. I'm still in touch with a lot of them. Uh, a lot of smart people. Even even now, I, I have so many questions. If I have any questions in the clinic, I'll always reach out to them. Um, and from there, I was always passionate about pelvic health, mainly because I went through a pelvic floor dysfunction. And back then when I was getting treated for it, I was at, you know, I had issues when I was like 19. And then as I got older, um, and there was no one really to treat it as me being a male, there's kind of a stigma associated with it. Right. Um, and for some reason, no one wants to go next to male genitalia, right? It's like the kryptonite for a lot of people, but um so pelvis nyc was kind of born out of necessity you know um and the goal was what i found there was a gap in not only knowledge but gap in people who were treating men and then mainly listening to men's issues so uh pelvis nyc was born really just with the goal of helping a million men hopefully uh with pelvic floor dysfunction with uh, urological issues, colorectal issues, um, and and yeah, and just and you know, hearing men out for for what their issues are. Absolutely. It's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting because um, Dr. Hill shared one of the reasons why she got into that particular section of physical therapy was because of her own personal experiences. So it's good to see that you've taken your personal experience to start a business and pick particular interest in this uh, niche. But did you know when you entered PT school that you wanted to become a business owner? 
Uh, it's a good question. I think before PT school, I always wanted to, mainly because, look, if we look at the salaries for, for physical therapy, you know, um, we can be candid about this. They suck. You're getting a doctoral level education. Yeah, let's be candid. You're spending, I mean, some people are spending over two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000, which I would then, adv- I'm not a financial advisor, but I would advise you not to go to PT school as the ROI makes no sense at that point, right? Mm-hmm. As we're adults, you start to look at stuff like, mortgages, childcare, and that shit makes no sense, right? If I'm going to make 70, 75K a year after taxes, maybe Florida, it's a little easier, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it isn't going that far here either. I mean, obviously you're in New York, but yeah, it, it's it, it's not, the, the math doesn't add up. Correct. Cost of living has increased, right? And, and clinic owners want you to see more patients per hour. So your quality goes down the drain. Um, and your biggest asset as a PT is listening to people and connecting with them. And excuse my French, but you can give fuck all connecting with people when you're not bringing home enough money and you got two <laughs> kids bugging out. You know, you, you don't even have time to go on vacation, whatever. All the small things in life that actually make sense. So I digress, right? But, but No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> but as, as I went to PT school, I remember you could ask my wife. I'll bring it down right now, right? I'm in my office, but. <laughs> I used to tell them, like, yo, I'm going to PT school. I'm busting my ass. Only make 70K. I have friends that didn't even go to college and that were making half a million dollars a year in finance or whatever, right? And, um, of course, I got into this to help people. But I always tell people, like, you can't you can't be the sacrificial lamb, right? In order to help people, in order to care, to go back home and look at research and and talk to people and other practitioners and on the weekends, try and better your skill to help patients, you got to feel taken that you're taken care of in a way, you know? And so I think to answer your question, yes, I always knew I would do some sort of business with it. And if I couldn't do a business, I probably wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have been where I am today. Probably would have just switched careers because that's the fulfilling part is getting people better, growing something, which would be a business that I know would maybe five, 10 years will help X amount of people, right? Um, as you see, I didn't come on here with like a button down shirt. I'm, I'm not trying to look important. That, that shit makes no see, difference. See, see how we addressed what we were? <laughs> That's what I tell my patients, right? Because my office is in a gym. It's not It's not a sterile office. Like I'm not giving, I'm not handing you pads to sign, right? Like, you know, amongst like some forms, but um People come in, they're usually like, what the hell am I doing here? You know, I'm in, I'm in a gym. And I'm like, well, you're here to get treated for pelvic floor. I also treat orthopedically, of course. But I want to make people feel at home. I want to make people feel like, hey, this is a, a thriving environment and you can thrive too. Because majority of the people that have come to me either have chronic issues or have been to other pelvic floor practitioners or even orthopedically, right? Like lumbar spine pain, cervical pain. And they're not getting their help they deserve. Other doctors, practitioners are not listening to them. And you'd be surprised. I don't think, I think you guys know, but you'd be surprised just listening to a patient, how far you get without even putting their, your hands on them yet when they just feel heard. So yep. I think well, that's- I, I mean, I, I used to be a faculty member uh, at the University of South Florida's PT uh, program down here. And, and that's what I always told the students. I was like, if you just listen, you know, the patient's going to give you the answer. They're going to give you everything that you need for you to figure, for you to make them feel better, feel heard, whatever the case is. You just got to listen. They're going to tell you everything. They're going to give you the gems. They're going to give you the clues that you need to just put it to put it in, in practice. Um, so absolutely. I mean, and, and, you know, as you mentioned, as PTs, one of our stronger suits is to make that connection because we spend the most time uh, with these patients more often than not. So if we can make that connection, it just fosters everything else to, to kind of flow uh, nice and smoothly. And then for your situation, like you said, you know, they, you're in a gym, they walk into a gym, they're like, well, what the hell am I doing here? Once you make that connection, man, you can tell them to jump on one leg and, and you know, quack like a duck or whatever, because you have that connection, they're going to follow you. And that's the biggest thing to getting patients better. Is that you got to you got to build that trust. You have got to build that rapport, so this person feels like, hey, this person generally cares about me, generally listens to me, and and things just 
it just happens. They, they flourish, they get better. Um, and then for, from a business standpoint, I mean, that's marketing in itself because if they come to you, Hey man, Adam, Adam's awesome. Adam takes care of me. Adam listens to me. They're going to tell everybody, right. especially in a place like New York where everybody's talking, everybody's cro- you know, like so many people crossing paths. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. 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 And, and think about it this way, right? How many times has the placebo been studied in, in research trials? Almost every time. Right. And so much happens in the placebo group. That's really where the money is like the placebo group, right? How do people get better sometimes without surgical, just as good as surgical intervention when nothing happened? So I'm not saying that what PTs do is placebo, but think about how important that is to connect to another human in 2022 when no one's fucking connecting. You know what I mean? Yeah. When no one is, I can tell you stories, right? Like I treat like single females in New York City who say they go on dates and like they don't, they can't even talk to other guys because nobody's like really... They, they don't know how to con- converse anymore. It's amazing. Yeah. That's one facet of it. But, you know, just human connection, like how we're enjoying the conversation now, it's so important to have that skill as a PT. Forget business owner, like just as a as a normal human, you know? So so are you cash-based only or are you do cash insurance? So I'll do both. Uh, okay. The reason being is I... I kind of want to allow access to as many people as possible, right? Like it's getting to a point where, I, I mean, I have a, I have a, almost a month wait list at this point. I try and get people in as much as I can. Um, but I also don't want to get burnt out. Right. But I, I am cash based and also, um, insurance based, which means if you have an insurance that's easy for me to work with and they have out of network benefits, right. I'll bill it. If not, I'll offer you a super bill, which you can submit to the insurance. Uh, and I honestly think that's where healthcare should be going. Um, because I tell people all the time, one of the things you see with a lot of these healthcare poachers, I call them, like, yeah, you got to come for 20 sessions or else you're not going to get better. And I tell people all the time, like, you're here at your own accord. You'll know when you get better because you're actively going to feel it. So who am I to tell you you need to come for 10, 20, 30, right? So I want to... I think whether in business or in life, anytime you give someone the power, you're always going to win because they don't feel locked in. That's also why I don't do packages. You buy five, 10, that's not the point here, right? I want you to feel like you want to be there. Not that you like have two sessions left, you're stuck. It's about you making the decision and you actively being an active participant in your recovery. So you're in in New York City and it's a very competitive market there in New York. Um, How do you go about with marketing? Because I believe it's a challenge for a lot of us as physical therapists to sell the value of our services and what we offer. We, people quote prices, but I honestly believe the prices that people quote is based on their level of uh, skill or what they feel because they went to school and they have the over 100,000 K in student loans. They're not basing um, pricing on what society perceives or value as physical therapists because someone could easily go to like a well-known personal trainer or a yoga instructor or something to get some of the benefits that we offer. So right. what do you do in terms of marketing to show value of what you in particular offer? So it's interesting because probably 60% of my practice or maybe 65 is pelvic floor and the other 35, 40 is orthopedic, right? Uh, And so when you're in a a highly niche market, you're sought out. And especially if you do well, you're you're even more sought out. So is it fair for me to say like, oh yeah, my marketing is amazing. I think for pelvic floor, it, it really is because I'm in a market where there's probably 12 to 15 more clinics that offer pelvic floor in New York City. For some reason, I come up really well. I have an SEO person in the Philippines, a virtual assistant that, I mean, shout out to Gazel. She's amazing. I love her so much. She's been like the backbone to my business. I owe her everything. Um, And so, yeah, just have a person that you trust and have a person that can really help you with whatever you need. So I suck at marketing, meaning I'm, I'm good. I can get in front of the camera all day, right? But when it comes to like a natural, 
<laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, put me on your podcast. You know, um, <laughs> I'm a monthly guest. Um, but make sure you have a good team behind you in regards to this stuff like that. You know, how, how do you set yourself apart? Again, highly niche. I don't know. If you want to work with dancers, make sure you're the dancer person. If you want to work with um, specifically people who have heel pain, or I mean, like, I think if you're trying to serve everyone, you're going to serve no one. Right? Like, I know, I know massage therapists that just say they're the back pain people, and they do very well in New York City, where there's a million massage therapists. And at the end of the day, when someone looks something up, they're looking for that specific thing, especially in 2022, because now you can Google everything, right? If I'm looking yeah. for a podcast for a sports physio, I, I, I mean, I'm looking for a specific podcast and that you guys might come up, right? So I think that's the most important thing. Just like, don't try and serve everyone. You see a lot of these websites that have neck pain, back pain, Bell's palsy, uh, all the crazy stuff that you can think of. And at the end of the day, someone's like, all right, I guess I'll go here. But are they confident with that decision? I don't know. Yeah, I, I took a, a business course with uh, Goldman Sachs. And one of the courses that they told us is that you can't do everything. You, you'll be a master at nothing. So find something in particular that you are great at and that is going to be your selling point. So I do agree with you. Even be companies specific. like, like, have you ever heard of HIMS? Yes. Hims. So they just served men, I believe, in the beginning, as per the name, Hims. And now they started serving women too. And they call it hers. So you can always start niche and then branch out. But now they got the recognition they deserve. And now, you know, they're in that space. But if you start broad, you can't really get too fine after that. I believe, I mean, I don't know. I could be wrong, but I think that's what works, you know? You know, yeah. it's, it's working. It's working for you. So, <laughs> yeah, and, and I think the, the most important thing is, is understanding that not everybody is your client, right? Like you, you're you're not there to service everybody. You can't. Yeah. You physically can't service everybody, and logistically you can't. Um, and and like you said, you know, when you're, you know, you, you'll hear the argument in PT like, well, we should be generalist, right? Because we want direct so you've got to be able to to see it all treat it all on, on a basic level which yeah you we have a basic understanding but when when we can kind of zero in a specific type of you know situation or or impairment or whatever the case may be then that's where we can really fine-tune our skills and get those people to come to us right but I completely agree with you once we're we're trying to cast this wide net. It's a lot harder to get that recognition when you're just a master of a lot of little things, not one big thing or one or two big things, right? So, um, so when you finished PT school, you went straight to Pelvis NYC, right? No, actually. So I was director of a neuro clinic coming out uh, at the Montefiore Hospital System in the Bronx. I was living in Queens at the time, which is really close to the, it was one of the five boroughs. Um, and it, it, it was MD owned. It was really difficult. Like the guy just cared about money and seeing more patients. Um, and after I finally got situated with another PT, I left after a couple months. Like this isn't for me. And I actually did really well in terms of salary because um, I told him what I could guarantee him. And I left and I took a $25,000 pay cut to go work in Manhattan to be the pelvic floor guy for another clinic. Um, that clinic then lost some money as a, as a business and then cut everyone's salary by around 24%, which is a, which is big. I just bought a house at the time and they said, we lost, we lost, uh, I think they, they said they lost, what are they? A couple hundred thousand in, in, in what was it? 2018, 2019. And they go, we're going to take a pay cut as a family. I said, I already have a family. I appreciate it, you know? <laughs> um, so, and then, and then they were like shocked when like, you know, they, they, they let me go and they're like, Adam, you're not really motivated. I'm like, yeah, you know, that's when I was already started building my practice on the side. And since then, I swear, I'm like, dude, 
any employees that come my way, like, let me nurture you. Like, let me take you under my wing. Let me pay you well. Let's make money together. You'll be happy and you'll do things that you do well within this business or, and you'll flourish. Right. And I want to give you that space. And I think that's most important because so many clinics eat their young nowadays. Like, they're just like, Oh, let me give you 40,000 and I'm going to, I'm going to give you an internship and teach you some stuff. Most of these guys are dinosaurs. They can't teach you anything, right? So you're yeah. stepping on some toes, Adam. You're stepping on some toes. <laughs> you know, it's funny because when even when I was in PT school, the director of my program was like, Adam, you're a bulldog. I don't know if you're gonna get past this this program. <laughs> and I was like, No, yeah, I'll get past it. But like, I don't know if you'll like me during it. You know, we ended up parting ways really well. I re- I mean, I really respect her. She was amazing. But, uh, but yeah, I've always stepped on toes. I think, I think those that step on toes are the game changers. I'm not saying I'm one of them, but I think it's really important to challenge the status quo because as we know in PT, the status quo really sucks, like from insurance, from how well we're respected within the healthcare system, um, and the list goes on, you know? So Yeah, I, I, always, I always say here on our, on our show that, like, you know PT as a profession, we sit at the kitty table, man. Like Thanksgiving comes around, you know, all the other professions, they get to sit at the big table, have the nice dinner. We're, you know, we're eating chicken nuggets on the side because we can't, we can't step up. Like we don't have the, the, and I don't even want to call it ambition because we do have people within, in our profession like yourself that want to push things forward, but we're, we're very complacent as a profession. We're like, Hey, we'll be, we'll, we'll sit over here. If you tell us we can come, you know, maybe we'll find a little room at the table, but we're cool over here. You know, not I mean, getting I don't really eat McDonald's because I keep kosher, but that 10 piece I heard was bomb, you know? So <laughs> you're in chicken nuggets at the kitty table. You're I, 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 as a home health therapist, it's, it's my go-to quick snack. <laughs> See, there you go. That works. Yeah, I, I, gotta, I gotta pack my lunch because if not, it, it goes from a 10 piece to a 20 piece real quick. I hear that. I hear that. See, then I gotta spend more time on the on the tread or the bike behind me. It's funny. Yeah, dude, just enjoy yourself, man. I know too many people like counting too close to calories. Like, you know, I like to eat. It just enjoy yourself. What's your background? Uh you talking about like nationality? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was I was born in Colombia, South America. Okay, this is um, amazing food. Like, how can you not oh, yeah, like? For sure, for sure. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> what about you? Like, I, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, so uh, Caribbean food. Amazing. I mean, it's yeah. full of flavors, and you know, it's yeah. amazing. <laughs> for sure. Like, I'm pretty. I'm, I try to be as strict as I can during the week. But weekends is like it's whatever. Like whatever is in front of me. My wife, uh, her mom is from Cuba, so I'm eating. All that, you know, black beans, rice, pork, the whole nine yards. Both my wife and my mother-in-law are amazing cooks. So, yeah, it's... And it's, he loves uh, the barbecue too, okay? So well, don't, yeah, don't I, do a lot of, I do a lot of smoking. Um, hey, all right. Got some, uh, you know, meat. I smoke everything. I got a big green egg. So out by the pool, hanging out, drinking, yeah. cooking. You know, life's good. Yeah. Yeah, man. So Adam, so, you said you um you about you have a backlog about a month. Have you thought about scaling or hiring? Because I know that becomes a challenge for a lot of um business owners. Uh like sure. when to hire and you know when to grow. It's funny because I've taken I you know Paul Goff, Greg Todd, um uh, Aaron Le- I haven't taken Aaron LeBarrow's quote, but I've been around that for so long and like you know. The thing that gets you to X or whatever X is for you, that might be a million, that might be 5 million, 10 million, or like patient scenes, will not get you to the next level. And so like what got me here, and I could have never imagined me being here where the business is and and the exposure that I've gotten will not get me to the next level in terms of like systems and hiring people and like what type of people to hire, like what's the right culture. There's so many questions there, you know? Um, but it's a very slow process and I'm being very careful, meaning I have, I've done a few interviews, um, and, and, you know, it's just a vibe. It's almost like a vibe check. Like people are there and I'm not looking for like the, the straight A student that does nothing for me. Um, 
You know, I, I want I want to see people think outside the box, differential diagnosis. But within that, give me some flavor of like a normal human. You know what I mean? Not a robot. So like, yeah, I want you to be able to think on your toes, but also be like a normal it's human. A, it's a culture thing. Like it's got to match your, your culture. You know, the, the, the vibe that you've established for Pelvis NYC, right? You, know, you right. got to be able to match that because if you don't, it's going to end up costing you more trying to to fix, you know, that higher and trying to catch up and, and stuff like that. So absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so the goal is, you know, hire like minded people, people that like want to make a difference and, and have a pelvis L.A., pelvis Miami, pelvis Houston, you know, um, you know, cover every metropolitan city. My goal is to go national, and we will, and uh, hire the right people so that we can do continuing education, um, you know, have different specialties within pelvic floor, like colorectal, urological, um, specifically, like, just the, like, the ED part of men's health. It's very important, you know? Um, so, so, yeah, hiring is, is tough, but I think it's, it's a slow process, and if you do it right, uh, just like Peloton, if you build the right community, that's going to be solid, dude. Speaking, so speaking of, uh, of oh, go ahead, Alex. <laughs> yeah, so speaking of Peloton, um, obviously, people can see that in behind me, Mo also has the bike and the tread. How how did you develop that relationship? Because I know on your Instagram, you know, you've been with so many instructors, uh, Alex Toussaint, uh, I think. Uh, who else did I see? Dennis Morton, I think I saw on one of your your posts, and, and some of the other uh, awesome, you know. And and I love them. And I, I think to your point about the community and stuff, you know, they they are what brings the people together, um, and and it makes you want to be a part of it, right? So, um, especially like Alex, I'm a huge Alex fan. Um, he, he's got that personality, you know, like kind of to the point that you were saying, like it's a certain personality, it's a certain vibe that you need to build to get that, that following that stuff. But how did you get that, that relationship going? Um, yeah. So I started treating them at the, the clinic that essentially this was like four or five years ago. That was like, Hey dude, we're a family. Um, <laughs> and at some point they started, they started taking a liking because I started to realize like they're coming in for a certain most of the time they're coming in for like soft tissue release maintenance type stuff. And I love this because every other PT completely shits on other PTs that do soft tissue work. Um, but I know that's what they needed. These guys were like in the fitness industry and they work in their bodies X amount of time a week. And, you know, I was keeping them, let's say I was keeping their brain and central nervous system safe enough to, to teach that many classes and, and, you know, be themselves. So, um, and then more and more started coming to see me and then, and that's how we started building trust. Um, and I, I didn't have that wow factor. They weren't celebrities. They're still not celebrities to me. They're just like friends and people that I'm trying to help get better. So I think that's, that's the most important thing. I just saw them like, like any other patient or client rather. Absolutely. Well, you know, Adam, there's some people that come into your life to introduce you to people that you're going to be like probably long-term relationships, personally and business-wise. So that family was introducing you to a new family. And that's what they did with Peloton instructors. So congratulations. And I love Cody and I love Adrian. So they're two of my favorite. Um, so <laughs> yeah, they're Cody's really well. <laughs> they're all, they're um, all like genuinely good people. Like, I can't say one bad thing about any of them. They're, what you see on camera, is like what you get in person. Like Cody is the sassiest mofo I've ever met, even in person, you know? Alex is exactly like that. Like, you know, if you ever see this, um, there's a documentary on Netflix on P. Diddy, right? I don't know if you saw yeah. it. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get your vibe right. If your vibe's not right, go take a walk, come back, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's very much like that. Uh, Dennis is like the chillest guy. Um, and of course, normally I wouldn't be able to talk about them, but they've all posted me on Instagram. So it's, it's public knowledge. Of course, there's no HIPAA issues here, but, 
um, yeah, they're all just great people. They're genuinely good people. Well, yeah. that's uh, it, the work that you do too. So that's 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 great. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm humbled that they trust me with their bodies. I'm humbled that um, you know they they come back and we have many great conversations. Some of them I train, some of them uh, we do rehab, and a lot of them we do soft tissue stuff. So um, I'm just just there to serve what they need. Um, I want to touch on something though because um, a few of the guys that you mentioned that you've done their courses. I've been taking some hits um, on social media um, for some of the advice that they've been giving, especially like the students and new grads to like start business and get into cash PD. I think you said you took uh, Paul Goes, uh, Greg Todd, and Aaron Labor. I didn't take Aaron Labor's course, but like you know, mm -hmm. I've I've been following them and they they give great value on online. They really do. Yeah, so uh, I know there have been some knocks on them for promoting like the cash PT and stuff like that and talking about business education not being as in abundance in PT school because there's no sense of direction when you got, graduate from PT school to, to start a business. And as you said, you know, the return on investment now as a physical therapist getting a DPT and coming out to work is, as you said, it's in the pits. I'm, I'm not going to say the exact word that you use. But <laughs> don't say I, I, I do curse, okay? I'm not... I don't. I'm not. I don't so, <laughs> um, so they have been taking a knock for it, but there, there's a lot of truth to it. Um, and the reason why a lot of people are complaining about burnout is because the return on investment is shit. And... Mm -hmm. It's, it's hard that you're not able to enjoy life, you know, because you have to pay these student loans back. If you're thinking about getting your own home or even traveling and doing all that stuff, it's, it's tough to do that right after school. Right. So, so some of us were lucky. So what's the question? So essentially you're asking, they get a lot of stuff for promoting. Yeah, they get knocked by, you know, a lot of people on social media, like on, especially on Twitter and Facebook for the stuff that they promote, saying that it's not really uh, the best advice to give to like new grads or students to jump yeah, into business right there's away. This, there's this BS connotation that like, A, a new grad can't start right out of school. Like for what reason exactly? Like, I'm sorry, three, three and a half years wasn't enough to know what the body does. And if I spent enough time doing you know, continuing education research, it's, it's not enough. Like what else do I need to see? Now, if you feel that you need to learn more, that's on you, mm -hmm. right? But I truly believe that the majority of professors in PT school, I mean, how many of them own businesses? How many of them got so burnt out? They're like, you know, I'm just going to teach. Look, I had some great professors. Shout out to Dr. Fong, who was an anatomy professor, who was the reason why I love what I do, because this guy like taught you about the body as if it was created by some sort of architect. I mean, I was in awe spending eight hours in his classroom on a Saturday. Really, it was amazing. But how many professors actually have been business owners? And if you look, if you compare and contrast PT and Kairos, Kairos do have a business background and they teach them what's important about marketing, even though some of it is snake oil salesman type stuff. But they teach them how important that is, right? It's important because if I can't get people in the door, then I have, I can't educate people about PT. So then what's all this education worth if I don't have a person to speak to about it? So when Greg Todd, Paul Goff, when they come and say like, hey, you don't need to learn more, I think they're right. If you feel like it, fine, that's on you, right? But how many MBAs come out of school and they still know nothing about business? There's no experience, but you know, in PT, in physical therapy within this realm, there's no mentors for really business. No one's going to take you under their wing. Who's a practice owner. Like if I'm in New York city, I'm not going to teach you about the business because I don't want competition. Now I'm not going to do that, but that's what's going on. That's the status quo. People are scared that someone's going to open up down the street. But I'm living proof in so many others of my colleagues that don't think this way, that don't have a scarcity mindset, that 
just understand that you don't have a viable business model if you think someone's going to steal your business, right? Yeah. That's why the, right. pie, the pie is big, is big and enough. We can all eat. Yeah. We can all eat. There's so much to go around. Yeah. Yeah. And so like this, this scarcity, PT has such a scarcity mindset because so many years we've had to hide behind MDs and referrals and insurance is telling us that, you know, it's not medically necessary and all this BS. And the truth is like, we only have, I think a, a very small percentage of the musculoskeletal market. Like majority of people are going to, you know, pain management doctors, um, chiropractors, physiatrist and i'm not saying this stuff is wrong i'm just saying we only have maybe five to ten percent of that pie there's so much more to go around through education right and if i don't have someone in front of me and i can't educate them it's worth nothing so what greg todd does what paul goff does is it's a men it's a mentality that they're trying to change they're like forget what you've learned you've been pro you, we have to reprogram what people have been taught which is to hide behind the curtains and wait Till someone comes behind it and asks for your help. So step out, and, step out and, of the kitty table. Exactly, exactly, and that's where my whole kitty table analogy comes from. Is like we 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 can't only sit at the table when somebody comes to tell us that we can sit at the table, as opposed to saying, "Hey, what you know, make some room because this is why we deserve to be uh, at this table. This is what." all the knowledge that we can educate. But you're right, if we got nobody to talk to, then them three years, that DPT, it don't mean nothing. Look, to be fair, we hear a lot of stuff, but I treated, I treated and still treat enough MDs to know that there, there, e there is even a hierarchy within that medical system of a certain being a certain doctor, right? If you're, if you're not a cardiothoracic surgeon, you're an orthopedic surgeon, if you're, uh, you know, like maybe you're a psychiatrist, maybe they're not as respected as, so there is that hierarchy there, but we're taught to, to look at a certain frame of, of mind and that's being a PT. But I just want to say to give the benefit of the doubt that you're going to see that in other forms of healthcare too. Right. But within physical therapy, there isn't enough movers and shakers that are saying, guys, wake up. Like we can make a huge difference and giving the young people that are coming through, I'm still young. I'm only four or five years in, in the profession, but giving you that confidence, like, yo, you can really change someone's life. You can really help people. So enough with all the other bullshit, like for, you know, like really stay focused on what you want to do. And so I think there needs to be more of that, even in healthcare in general. Right. But like, we're just talking PT there's too much scarcity going around. Too many professors saying like, wait, be careful. Every question on an exam is like, are you going to kill someone? Yes or no. Always go with the answer that says, no, you're not going to kill them. Right. Everything is meant to keep you safe. So yeah, yeah but uh, that's yeah. Tangents, what the truth is, you know, like yeah, yeah. No, those are good points. Those are very good points. Um, so what are we going to go ahead? ahead. I was going to ask, um, Adam, in what way would you inspire other um, male students or male therapists to get into to pelvic, pelvic health? Because there doesn't seem to be too many of those. Totally. So I actually get a lot of inquiries from students who are like, hey, are you taking students, whatever. Um, but start with, start with your faculty and see how they react to it, right? Like when I was going through pelvic floor dysfunction, I went up to one of the faculty in my school and he go, I was like, can you help me like find a practitioner or research? And he's like, ah, there's not much research on it. Pretty much told me that not to F off, but like, was like, yo, I'm sorry, bro. And this guy was like the research professor for the school. I was like, dude, all I need you to do is like go into PubMed, help me out. Right. So, um, start with your faculty, see if they can help you see if they can start a special interest group. Maybe they can reach out to the previous, um, alumni, uh, you know, go on social media, start reaching out to like Sus Dr. Susie Gronsky is amazing for, for pelvic health. She's been in the field for a long time. Um, Joanne Milios in Australia, uh, Dr. Gerard Green, Dr. Bill Taylor. These are all great names and they've been coming out with awesome research, case studies, of course. Um, and I think some better stuff, but 
um, they're really at the forefront of, of male pelvic PT, you know. Um, soon, hopefully, I'll be able to get on their level. But these are respected people within the field that you can maybe ask for mentorship or maybe even just shoot questions as you get, like, more involved. And then, of course, there's Herman and Wallace and then the APTA Special Interest Group for, for Pelvic Floor. So there's enough to start with, right? Um, and then there are, of course, there are books that have nothing to do with physical therapy and that speak about uh, pelvic health. Headache in the Pelvis is one of them. Um, there's a great massage therapy book. It's called, uh, I think, is it Out in the Open? It's like, a, it's, it's about, I'll get the name, but I think it's Out in the Open. Could be wrong, but I think it's that. It's amazing. So start slow, you know, get curious. Start reading stuff that have nothing to do with physical therapy. See if you can attribute it. Be that mover and shaker. That goes with anything, you know? Uh, most definitely. But how do you get men, especially, to be comfortable talking about stuff like erectile dysfunction and, you know, having issues like the last patient that I saw, relatively young guy, uh, was... He had an accident where he fell off a, a, a diving um, platform and injured his pelvic area. And he couldn't exactly tell the male doctor that was attending to him that he had wet himself or he can't tell when he was going to urinate. But he felt comfortable sharing all of that with me uh, this afternoon. But there are a lot of people who don't share those things. and live quietly and in shame and it's affecting their quality of life and their relationships. Yeah. How so, do you get people to be comfortable talking about that? So Which one is- of the things I always tell patients when they come in, I'm like, listen, there are, are no stupid questions. And I want, this is an open book. There's nothing I haven't heard. And even if it's something that I haven't heard, I'm here for that reason. Right. And, and I let them know this is a quality of life issue. This is something that's bothering you. So, I'm not a homosexual male, but there are many homosexual males that want to be able to bottom, right? That means having sex through the through the anus. And I'm like, okay, so we'll help you do that, right? So I think it's important to what what are the questions that you need to ask to get that through, right? How do you make someone comf- How do you make someone comfortable? Listen to them, look at them, let them know they're being heard. Not, right? Maybe put a hand on their shoulder. Normal human type stuff. Um, and if you're not comfortable treating males, then don't do it, right? Because when I was at the pelvic floor course, Herman Wallace, male pelvic floor, I was one of very few males. And a lot of the females there just kept asking questions like, oh, what happens if um, if a guy gets an erection? And she's like, well, you know, you want to keep your boundaries. And I, I understand that's very important. And females don't do go through some sort of harassment sometimes. But if you're not comfortable with a guy getting an erection, it is what it is. You shouldn't treat it. Like it might happen, it might not. You're treating male genitalia. At the end of the day, get all this stuff out of your mind. You're treating someone who wants to get better. Most of the people couldn't care if I looked like, you know, Freddy Krueger. They just want to get better at the end of the day. So have a human approach. Ask the correct questions. Have any bowel, bladder, sexual function. Even in regards to back pain. How many people are like, hey, um, you know, what do I do? What position do I get in? If I want to be intimate with my wife, I can't really get into like the missionary position. So you try and work something out, but like sex is a quality of life issue. We know this, this is a normal thing, right? The reason why there's testosterone, estrogen, right? So it's important to know that that's, that's like a normal thing. We got to talk about that. Urination. That's a, no- you can't pee. You got a problem, my friend. Um, if you can't defecate properly, you have a problem. Right? That's how we let go of all the bad stuff in our body. It's, it's a part that relieves you. Everyone that's a husband knows that that's your sanctuary time too, you know? It's really important. <laughs> My wife knows that that's like I go there and like she's like, are you really in there for a half hour? I'm like, babe, I'm busy, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right, dude. It's exactly it's, right. It's really important. So just from that aspect, it's a quality of life thing. It's a good quality, quality of life thing. So it's really important to know um and just ask the correct correct questions what what is important for this person one of the things i always ask is if there's something i can get rid of today like that what could it be and it means that i'm fine-tuning myself to the top one or two things that they think is really important 
I think that's a question that should be asked, whether you're treating orthopedically as well, um, because the person knows that you're listening to them. And that's going to be the most important thing. You get that better, or at least you start to get you get that better first. That's your buy-in. That's what that person cares about. And from there, you could branch out. So you, you mentioned your wife. Is your wife in healthcare at all? No, she's in HR. So, you know, she's safe. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's all the rules. She gives me all the rules, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a good teamwork. It's a good team player to have on, on the on the team uh, when you're trying to grow a business. Now, you know, I've always come on here and I've, you know, said it time and time again, like, I don't get to be who I am as a a business owner, as a PT, as a, a man, and, and everything that goes into even just doing this podcast, if it's not for the support that I have for my wife. Um, how instrumental has she been in you being able to, to do what you do with Pelvis NYC and what you want to do moving forward? Dude, I would have not been where I've been today had it not been for my wife. And even so... I think forget like strong women, but like just a strong partner in, in general is very important. Um, I mean, my wife already graduated college when I was like just applying to PT school. Like, I don't know, she saw something in me where she was like, oh, this guy has, is somewhat of a go-getter, right? But then going through PT school and she was already working and she's already older, right? She's six months older than me. Uh, and just having that, this support system through hard exams and like thinking that PT is not for me because of the salary or whatever, it was all very important. I would have not been where I am today without it. That's, that's without question. Uh, that's, that's pretty good too. Um, that, you know, you have that support system because a lot of people who are in businesses, it, it's hard to obtain that work-life balance. So I'm, I'm glad that, you know, you do have that and cherish it as much as, as much as possible. I mean, Look, any anytime you have a partner, you want to make sure that there's a mutual respect. And, and look, sometimes I have very little because she's like, she always puts herself first. Even if I have a meeting, she's like, don't worry, I'll take care of the kids. But like, you want to support her as much as, you know, you can. So anytime she has a, an interview, CEO, whatnot, we're always practicing. I'm trying to give her more confidence, right? And it's really important. There's that give and take. That's what love is, a give and take between a spouse, you know? And so she has been, I mean, monumental to, to my business and, and why I am who I am today. Absolutely. And how does that impact, you know, you've got, you mentioned earlier before we got on, you've got two girls, uh, I've got two boys. Like, do, do they, do they know, you know, what daddy does? Like, do they, or is it just, you know, you're just dad and like hanging out and, and doing that? Like, how does, how does that part, you know, factor into your business, your day-to-day -day life? Like my boys, you know, they see me in the morning, they're like, okay, dad's going to work, dad, have a good day, you know, but they know what I do. Mm -hmm. um, do your girls know what it is that you do? So they're a little young, but you know, my, my oldest one, she's four and a half and she, she's like, Oh, daddy puts cups on people, you know, like something like that. Um, so, so yeah, she thinks I put cups on people, which is great. Um, so she literally takes a cup out of the closet. She goes, this is what you do? Like, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And so I went to school. That's what they taught me. Uh, yeah. So not really. And then my other one obviously is two. So she's like barely speaking right now. But, but yeah, they have some idea. They know that I, they call it. It's like Abba, Abba's uh, dad in Hebrew. She's like, Abba heals people. He gets people better. He gets people out of pain. So she has some sort of gist, right? So, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Dude. Yeah. It's great. So do you live, you don't live in Manhattan, right? No, no. I live in one of the suburbs outside of Manhattan. Uh, what I One of the five boroughs in Staten Island. So it's pretty close. Yeah, I, I drive in every day. I think about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Traffic. And where did you say, what part of New York did you say you grew up in? Uh, Staten Island. Staten Island. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I had, uh, so when I finished PT school, I did a sports residency in South Carolina. And my roommate was from Long Island. Uh, cool. He, he uh, so like, very cool guy. 
Uh, I can definitely see the the New York uh, in, in both him and now you. Um, yeah. It's just it's just a vibe, and yeah. one that usually for me is like right on my wavelength. So um, definitely, if I ever make it up to New York at any time, we'll have to try and uh, link up sometime. But uh, uh, speaking of New York, how was it with COVID, man? Like, how was how did that? impact your practice i mean obviously we know from the news and you know how political it got in, in different parts of the country you know you always hear about florida and me and and the things that happen here you know good bad and different whatever each person's thoughts may be on that but obviously different and same things happened in new york how did that impact you uh first of all as a person as a husband like your family and then what that meant for your business. Yeah, luckily, um, I was very lucky because the second I was able to start treating legally, um, I was packed. Like I, 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 It was the opposite of what every other physical therapy business uh, went through. Uh, mainly, don't forget, I'm a, I'm a single practitioner right now. I mean, at the time and still now, but uh, yeah, I had a packed schedule. Um, you know, we had, we have the COVID precautions as much as we could, but most of the people that wanted to see me were in really bad pain, you know, like pelvic floor pain is no joke. And then of course, um, yeah, a lot of the people that came to see me really needed it. So again, that's the, one of the, the, the blessings of being in a niche market, you're going to be needed, right? Knee pain. I could wait, right? Like I could wait, but something that's like shooting into your rectum and keeping you awake, you might need to get help as soon as you can. It's one facet of it, but so I, I, it didn't affect me in that regard. And also it allowed me, I think that's when I met my virtual assistant, allowed me, allowed me to do more for marketing and really hone in on what I need to do um, in order to get to the masses. So do you ever offer any treatments like in-home um, or everything is done at the gym? So everything's done in the office. I used to, uh, like during COVID, of course, of course, we couldn't go into the office. And I had some clients that were just like, yo, do you mind seeing me in my house? I was like, sure. Yeah, that's fine. You had to do what you had to do. You didn't know the ambiguity of the situation would drive you nuts, right? Mm -hmm. But um, no, I don't, I don't do that anymore. Luckily, I don't have to, but also um, it would just be too much energy, to be honest, you know? It really would. Plus, it's weird. I feel like it's weird doing pelvic floor uh, assessment in someone's house, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. You just I, 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 I do get you. I do get you. I mean, we, we, we do it. But yeah. yeah, I mean, you just never know what you're going to get when you walk into somebody's house. Obviously, Mo and I were both home health PTs. So, you know, the, the amount of different things that, that we've walked into um, – can only get magnified when you're dealing with somebody's uh, pelvic region and, and doing all that stuff. So yeah, that would be probably a little bit awkward um, in, in certain situations. Now you mentioned your virtual assistant, um, which I think is kind of brilliant to, to be able to do something like that. Um, I've heard of it, you know, being used never honestly in, in the PT world, but I've thought even myself, in home health, I've thought of, you know, how can I um, make that a part of my my practice? You know, whether for me, it's like calling patients, setting up appointments and, and things that can easily be managed that don't necessarily require me, which then frees me up to either handle more of the business or be with my wife and kids instead of spending an hour calling patients trying to set up the next day. So how did how did you get to the point where, hey, I need to look into a virtual assistant? And then what kind of things were you looking for when you decided to go with uh, your assistant now? So uh, <clears throat> when it comes to anything that I don't know, I'm always asking people within the field, like, hey, what are you doing for this? What are you doing for this? Right? Even though I learned how to bill insurance, I asked someone who was billing insurance. And that's like how I figured out how to do it. So. Um, I think at the time, Greg Todd had a virtual assistant and I reached out to her and we started to work together and it wasn't the optimal relationship. So then I found, um, you know, another virtual assistant that I worked with, but I would have never known that was a thing if I didn't see someone who had success with it. Right. 
I just would have been struggling like everyone else. Um, uh, so I think, yeah, ask more questions and people that are in front of you, just see what they're doing. And if it works, and that resonates with you, just copy it. So I didn't really know until I saw it being done. What kind of things do you use your assistant for? Mainly like SEO. So Google, Google my business listing, that type of stuff. Um, some social media stuff, because I really dislike social media. Um, I, I just don't like it. Yeah, I don't, I don't like being fake, dude. And I see so many people being fake and I can't do it. Maybe one day I'll have to do it. Because I know, um, you know, God willing, one day I'll offer a course or whatever it may be. And the only way to really market it is just to get in front of your audience, right? YouTube videos or whatnot. Um, yeah, you, you definitely have to get used to it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, so she does the, the SEO stuff, which, by the way, is, is so important for your business. Just getting a few blogs up, um, using certain keywords. I mean, you wouldn't believe just, just a few blogs and what they could do for your listing on Google. And I'm in New York City. So there's a lot more competition than, say, someone in Louisiana. Right? Um, and I don't do any paid marketing at all. Zero. So pretty much your word of mouth and the SEO um, things. Uh -huh. And you could be genuine on social media too. Be uh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to encourage Alex to, to, know, to be more out there, but he's, you know. <laughs> I mean, I don't, honestly, like for me, per, my, most of my social media um, is, you know, me and my family, which I don't have a problem sharing with people um, because that's my why that's why i do everything that i do is to have the ability to to be with my wife and my kids and to go on vacation and we go to disney I mean, if you are my on my social and my instagram or whatever you're probably gonna see me at disney all the time but that's just what we like to do um yeah so we were just there this past weekend we're going again this weekend right, um nice. so um it, it you know everybody has their their different whys and and, and what we do um, and, you know, Mo and I, and specifically for our podcast is we just wanted to be real, you know, whoever that may be, whoever, you know, our guests are and who we are as, as individuals is just real. Because like you said, there's a lot of people that put on this facade, this persona, because they think it's what other people want to see or, or they think it's what's going to drive their their you know their followers or, or you know whatever their objective is and at the end of the day i think people can see through that and and as long as you're authentic and, and real then uh, you, you know you'll always be comfortable to sleep at night that you know you 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 are who you say you are yeah yeah it's important uh well i, I hope i see some future courses from you and that will probably mean that you have to be out there saying, hey, you know, I'm offering pelvic health courses for men, for women to make you comfortable treating men. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the um, goal is eventually to treat women as well. Not myself, but, hmm. um, you know, we'll get a few women pelvic floor practitioners because uh, I believe it's easier to treat your own uh, anatomy. Let's call it that, right? Um, it's easier to explain. Um, so hopefully soon we'll get that done. Good deal. Good deal. Man, Adam, well, it was a blast. Um, thank you very much for, for being with us tonight. Um, learned a ton. Um, I, I could definitely see why, uh, you know, you, you're having the success that you are. I mean, like, like you said, you're, you're, a uh, four years in, huh, what's that? He's four or five years in, so yeah, you know, he's, he's doing. You're doing pretty good. Yeah, you, you're just getting started, man. But but you're uh you're that shaker, as you mentioned. You you don't not complacent, and <laughs> <laughs> and that and that's what we need. That's what we need, obviously, in, in pelvic health, because when dealing with primarily men, we don't have that. As as you experienced, and that's why Pelvis NYC became what it is now and, and what it's going to be in the future is because you found, Hey, there's a need. I can fill it. I can do it well. And then it just organically grows from there. Um, so, you know, wishing you lots of, lots of luck, man. 
again, really enjoyed having you on our podcast tonight. Uh, if there's ever anything that we can do to help you or help your business, please don't hesitate to reach out um, because we, we thoroughly enjoyed it, man. And, and we'll have to figure out a, another time to, to do a round two and, and kind of catch up and, and see how things are going. Let's do it. And thank you for, for just um, offering a wonderful platform um, for a wide variety of PTs and, and people that do things differently. Um, I wish you guys much success. And I think it's going to happen really quickly for you guys. Uh, you guys are easy to talk to, great vibes, and um, and you guys are awesome. So thank you. I appreciate it, man. Much respect with that. We, we, we got a comment, and it happens to be one of my sisters. I, I, I don't know. I, I really appreciate them. As Alex says, family is everything. So she said, great, as usual, great content, and she thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. She was probably cracking up, laughing at some of the stuff that you were saying, but you kept it real. And that's that's what we encourage um, on this podcast, real conversations. And I hope you have inspired some others to get into public health as well. Yeah, and if you guys ever need anything, any questions at all, like I said, there's no stupid questions, I'm always here for you guys. Thank yeah, you, real quick, real quick, let people know how they can get in touch with you or, or um, you know, how, how they can reach out to you. Yeah, sure. So um, the website is pelvis.nyc. Uh, there's an email there, drpelvis at pelvis.nyc. There's a phone number. Um, there's an there's an inquiry box. You can you can throw any questions, a few blogs, um, and yeah, just to say what up, uh, send me an email. I'm always here. Awesome. <laughs> okay. awesome. All right. Well, thank you, so great, for, so thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. As usual, like, subscribe, follow us, share, let your friends know, let your family know. Um, and then, again, thanks, Adam, and everybody have a good night. See you guys. All right. Good night. <laughs>